दी उपनिषद सीरीज रिलीजन इज फियरलेसनेस बिफोर आई बिगिन लेट मी एक्सप्लेन सर्टेन थिंग्स फॉर कम्युनिकेशन देर आर टू डायमेंशंस वन इज नोन एज oral transmission this is through speech it is in certain intimate moments it becomes possible and it becomes a communion the ancient traditions like sufism the upanishads they were all oral transmissions nothing was written it was communed person to person this is upanishad ekoli the medium of speaking the oral transmission requires a personal touch the message is communed in a personal way or a way to the seeker when we look into bhagavad gita it was meant to bring about transformation in arjun it was an intimate communion it was not meant for anyone else and when it was happening nobody had the faintest idea that it can become in times to come one of the great treaties it is my understanding all that is precious in this world is always an intimate dialogue the depth this intimate dialogue creates in the process of transformation cannot be achieved through any other medium the medium of writing therefore all that is precious is oral transmission i had the great difficulty when the first publication went in to the press the normal accepted way of writing is using the third person and i did not want to use the third person because it is a person to person communion i am speaking to the one who is reading so i must use the first person i am speaking and to you i am speak addressing you are the second person it was a communion between first and the second person and sometimes there are certain statements which cannot be put if suppose there is a parable or something of that nature it cannot be put into first and second person i must use the third person so when my publisher saw the script he said that this has to change i said no i am creating a new system of writing writing should not be abstract instead it should be alive it can only be alive when it is addressing the person directly directly means i am speaking to you just as it is happening in this very moment i am speaking to a congregation but i am addressing only to you an intelligent disciple out of 
such congregation picks up the messages that are meant for him and he starts working on them. I recall once it happened, there was one such congregation in which the Sheikh Sufi Omkar Nath said, so Sufi Omkar Nath was having a talk, he was addressing to the congregation and he said in a unique way, if God ever gives you an opportunity to do his work, always open a department to store. That was the message. But when you translate into a spiritual field, supermarket is the one that carries a wide range of items, no specialty item. Whatsoever a common man needs, he can get it there. If you need any specific item, you have to go to specialty stores. That way you can take care of every single individual. Basic needs. So you can pick up from that what message is needed for you. So oral transmission is most precious. Sri Aurobindo spoke nothing. Instead he wrote. So all his work is written and that's where he failed. It has become an abstract message, impersonal. And the effectiveness of an impersonal matter is least writing is abstract. As a result, Sri Aurobindo remained an intellectual desert where nothing grew. So the book, his book was carried on in a personal manner through the mother. Krishna, when we look into Christ, Buddha, Raman, Mahabir, Muhammad, Krishnamurti, all have chosen the medium of oral transmission. Oral transmission is personal. The medium of writing is impersonal as long as you are using the third person. So I had to explain to the publisher that these are not the abstract works. It is a person-to-person -person communion in an Upanishadic tradition. The master addresses to a common student. He takes the mean intelligence of the student and addresses the mean intelligence so that from an ordinary to an extraordinary level of understanding can understand the message. Traditionally in writing we use third person while oral communion is a dialogue between the first and the second person. Writing becomes abstract as a result the ancient sages choose the way of Upanishad. Oral transmission is directed to someone known. However, all writings remain uncertain to whom it is being directed or for whom it is meant. It is abstract. Oral communication is personal to its very core. Krishna is directly speaking to Arjun without any thought of the world. It is communion between two friends. The situation 
with Ramakrishna was slightly different. He had the experience, but he did not have the voice or the means of communication with the wider cross-section of humanity. He wanted his message to be communed. He needed a voice to transmit his experience as message. All he had the experience but was unable to transmit. When Ramakrishna met Vivekananda, hopes arose in him that his message will now be communicated. Vivekananda had the voice, had the logic, but no experience. It was easy for Ramakrishna to translate that experience to him and let Vivekananda become the medium. As a result, Vivekananda had no choice but to become the medium for the transmission of the message of his master Ramakrishna. In the first meeting, Vivekananda had the taste of Samadhi. Ramakrishna's very presence was capable of giving the experience of Samadhi, his touch, his words, his very look, all was communicative and could, could be translated into Samadhi. When Vivekananda had the experience of Samadhi, tremendous energy arose within him. There was a person in Ramakrishna Ashram, his name was Kali. He was an idol worshipper. He had all kinds of stone, the big stone, the small stone, the fat, the thin, all kinds of stones. And he used to worship, so almost whole day he will be worshipping. He had almost 300 such stones. He is doing, singing, putting the, anointing them and all that. Vivekananda spoke to him about the futility of all this. He told Kalu Goddess, formless, why to worry about this? He said, okay, whatever you are saying is right, but let me anoint all these gods. So when Vivekananda experienced Samadhi and tremendous energy arose within him, he decided to give a message to Kali. So intuitively, a telepathic communication he went and Kalu got the message and he took all these stones, put them in a bundle, putting on his shoulder, he was carrying it to submerged into the nearby river Pugi. As he was going, Ramakrishna saw it and he asked, what are you doing? He said, I am going to submerge these stones into the river because God is formless and there is no need of all that. Ramakrishna said, Kalu, you go inside. Let me see you. Let me deal with the person who did this mischief. He went, broke open the door of the room where Vivekananda was in intense samadhi. He shook him up. He said, I gave you the taste of samadhi, but today I take back the key from you. From now onwards, you will not have this experience. You have misused it. Vivekanand begged and at this after accepting Ramakrishna said only three days before your death you will experience Samadhi because I want you to do my work to transmit all these experience to humanity. 
and Vivekananda after that incident did not have the experience of Samadhi. A Samadhi is not really a Samadhi wherein the keys of that remains in the hand of others. A Samadhi which becomes a telepathic communication is not a Samadhi. It is personal, it is transformational, it brings about transformation into you and it should not be used as a telepathic communication. In this is how it happened between Vivekananda and Ramakrishna. So the communion between the master and disciple always remains that of oral transmission and this oral transmission is very powerful and it should be used. Now coming back to religion is fearlessness. Religion must and does bring fearless in you. How can you be loving to someone whose very presence creates fear in you? Fear and love never go together. Indeed, a religious person will be fearless. Man is all alone. He is in darkness. He is without support. He is unsafe and afraid. This alone is his one. The way to get rid of it is religion. Religion is fundamentally the way of working in the state of fearlessness. And it is only in that state the growth happens. But the religions are really afraid of fearlessness itself. Their support and life itself is the fear in the hearts of people. Fear itself is their food and life. And fearless means the end of their life. The fear in men have been exploited a great deal. And in this exploitation, religions have not been far behind. Perhaps they have been foremost. With the support of fear alone, the supernatural being exists. Even your gods of all the religions exist with the support of fear. Remove the fear and the castle of religion will stumble. You go to worship because you feel if you do not, there will be a wrath. Remove the fear and the castle of religion will stumble. The supernatural supported by fear have merely threatened men. But even so, this has never been more than a game for their pleasure. But the fear supported God and has killed man outrightly. His game has been very costly. Life got entangled in the net of fear and how could happiness, how could bliss be there where there is fear and fear alone? How could love be born? How could peace be there? How could truth emerge? Bliss is the offshoot of fearlessness. Fear is end of life, fear is death. Fearlessness 
leads to eternal life that the supernatural lives on fear could be understood but god should also live on it is very unseen and if god also subsists on fear then there could be no way to get out of the clutches of these supernaturals for a man of understanding god is no relation has no relation to fear god has no relation to fear god who has created the entire creation out of his free will cannot allow the fear to perpetuate then how did the fear perpetuate it into the religious field most certainly in the name of god someone else is exploiting humanity using fear as a means religion is not in the hands of the religious people it is said that whenever a discovery of truth is made the satan is the first to take hold of it the souls in which the religion is manifested and those which deal in religion are not only different but are basically opposed to things the souls in which religion has manifested and those who deal in religion are not only different but are basically opposed to one another buddha's message emerged evolved deep within him the entire priestly community was against him during his time but afterwards they became the custodians when i look at the birthday celebrations of buddha the baser minds used the traditional method of offering flowers doing the aarti and anointing and things like this i saw recently a celebration of the birth anniversary of nakshbandi sheik lala ji sheik ramchandra ji lata lagno the aartis are being done the flowers are being offered is this the way a nakshbandi sheik will like his birthday to be celebrated no the people who are holding the port are unable to transmit what is the message of lala ji or for that matter the message of a buddha so they use the other methods they come back to their known rather than remaining in the unknown realm so the souls in which the religion first manifested and those who deal in religion are not only different but are basically opposed religion has all along been in the hands of its enemies and if this is not realized while there is time is still the future of man will not be good or worthy of a welcome religion has to be saved not from the non religious instead from the so called religious ones and without doubt this job is more difficult and troublesome as long as religion is based on fear it cannot be a real religion god's basis is love jesus said god is love 
God has nothing to do with fear. Then how did fear perpetuate it into religion? It is because of those baser minds. Man needs the God of love. There is no other way to God except love. Fear breeds hatred. And when, where there is fear, love is impossible to take birth. Religion wanted to live on fear and therefore its temples gradually got shattered. Temples are for love. Temple of fear are impossible. Fear has no temple. It has only prisons. Ask yourself. Are you the temple of religion or the temple of prison? You should ask this question. If religion is fear, then temples will not remain a temple, instead will become prisons. If religion is fear, God himself cannot be more than the chief prison officer, will not remain the omnipresent, omnipotent God. What is re religion? Fear of sin? Fear of hell? Fear of punishment? Fear of greed? Or fear of good deeds, of reward or heaven? No, certainly religion is neither fear nor greed. It is beyond both fear and greed. Greed is nothing but extension of fear. Religion is fearlessness. Religion is freedom from all kinds of fear. I have heard an old anecdote. Once there lived two brothers in a town. They were the wealthiest in that town, and perhaps the name of town was the town of darkness. The older brother was very religious. Daily and regularly he would go to the temple. He would give charities and do good deeds. He would listen to religious discourses and discussions. He would sit in the company of the good, the saints. Because of him there was a gathering of the saints daily in that house. On account of his attention to God and the saints he had become entitled to heavens in the other world. This was explained to him that the good men and saints deserve heaven. It is written in the scriptures because those scriptures were also made by the group of those good men and saints. On the other hand, he exploited wealth. And on the other, he would give charities and do good things. Heaven cannot be attained without charities. There can be no wealth without exploitation. The wealth comes from the opposite of religion and religion is the puppet of the wealth. He exploited others. The good men and the saints exploited him and the exploiters have always been good friends. However, he always pitied his younger brother. He was not good at collecting money and consequently was getting unable to collect religion either. His behavior was full of love 
and truth was coming in the way of his reaching God. He was neither going to the temple nor, he did, nor did he know the ABC of the scriptures. His condition was definitely pitiable and his account in the other world was blank. He used to avoid good men and the saints also as people would avoid infectious diseases. In the same way, he avoided good men and saints. If the saint enters the house from one gate, he would go out from the other. His religious brother used to request many saints to change the heart of his non-religious brother. But they said there could be a change only if he would stay near the saint, but he would not stay. But one day, a full-fledged, a real saint came there. No one knew how many non-religious people he had converted into the religious. In the, he was an adept in the theories of peace, persuasion, threat and division. It was his profession to convert people to religion. It is on such saints that foundations of the religion rest. Otherwise, religion would have disappeared long ago. When the older brother repeated his request to him, he said, Do not worry. That fool will now be in trouble. I will now see that he remembers God. What I say, I always. Saying this, he took up his stick and accompanied the elder brother. He was a wrestler in the past. Thereafter, finding the saintliness as a better profession, then wrestling he became a saint. He caught hold of the younger brother immediately on arrival. Not only did he catch him, but he floored him down to the ground and sat down on his chest. That young man who was not able to understand anything he was speechless out of surprise. Even so, he said, Sir, what, are, what is all this? What are you doing? The saint said, Change of heart. The young man laughed and said, Please leave this aside. Is there a way? Is this a way to change the heart? Please take care. You may not get hurt in the body. You may not get hurt in the body, the saints said. We do not believe in the body, we believe in God. Say Ram, and then alone I will leave you. Otherwise, you will find no one worse than I. The saint was very generous. And therefore, in the interest of the young man, he descended to the level of thrashing him. That young man said, What relation is there between fear and God? And does God have a name? I will not say Ram like this, whether life or not. And then he pushed down the sea. After this, after his fall, the saint said, Wonderful, wonderful, you have said what you had to say. Even in saying that I will not say Ram, you have uttered his name. His brother was very angry with him because the saint was talking. And he was very much pleased with the saint. 
he had made his atheist brother utter the name of God. The glory of the name of Ram is so great that uttering his name once even by mistake he will take a person beyond the sea of this life. That day he gave a feast to the whole town. After all his younger brother has turned religious. Such is the way that we know of religion. But religion is fearlessness. And if it does not breed fearlessness into you, it is not worth the time. And this is the essence. Religion is lovingness. It must breed in you love. Religion is the fragrance of love.